Good morning, New Vision Center. Good morning. My name is Reverend Leslie Goodwin, and I am the other half of your co-senior ministry, along with Reverend Karen Lewis. And it is just my deep honor to welcome every single one of you and every single one of you into our community this day. You are the community. This is a community-centered organization where every single beloved matters, is heard, belongs, is wanted. Oh gosh, already this morning. I don't usually cry in the intro. So my talk this morning is called I Release. And if you are brand new to our community, I really invite you to go back to our January talks because we have an annual theme that is moving us through this pattern of the spiritual hero's journey with the idea being that you, you, are the hero in your own spiritual hero's journey. And there are these things that we go through in this process of birthing the life that we choose. And one of the reasons Holly picked that song is because we've been, we've been working through this pattern and we've we've been called to adventure and we, we might have turned it down at first. Has that ever happened to you where you get called to some great thing and you're like, oh, that sounds challenging or hard or scary or what if I don't know how? But we've accepted our call. We have found mentors and friends to help us along the way. We've gathered all of our tools and then we've crossed the threshold out of our ordinary life, that which we're used to, into a calling for something new. And we have had trials, we've had things come up that we've had to handle, and we've come through them. And all along the way, we've been saying, oh, oh, we're getting closer to the tentacles. Oh, we're getting closer to the dying rebirth section there at the end. And finally, my friends, we are there. We are at the tentacles, which is why an alternate title for this talk Ack! Tentacles! <laughs> and we're all going to take a breath together because it is okay. It is okay to be at the place of ack! Tentacles. The thing about this dying and rebirth thing, you know, we talk about it every Easter. We talk about it through various stages the leaves have the, the trees have to drop their leaves in order to grow new ones we know that this is a natural part of life of evolution that we can't have the next thing if we don't let go of the one but there is a tendency to just cling to what we have known because it's safe right we know what it is even if it's not the best thing for us it's safe and so we hold 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 on and so this talk is about just releasing all the way into the knowingness that the, it's time for the dying. And how can we do that with grace? It's time for the releasing. How do we learn to do that in a way that opens us up to the next rather than closes us down and shuts us in? How do we do that? What does this teaching offer us for tools and wisdom so that we see the tentacles, it's totally normal to go, ah, tentacles, but then we go, oh, tentacles. <laughs> you know, the kraken is coming. If the kraken is coming and we can't stop the kraken, we might as well figure out how to ride the kraken, right? So how do we do that? How do we do that in Science of Mind and how do we do that together? The first thing is getting, just getting real to what's got to go. Just getting real to it. Looking at our own lives and owning that there are things that are not working. I bet every mind right now just had something pop up, whether it's a really unorganized junk drawer in the kitchen, a personal relationship that just isn't flowing right, a job that isn't the best fit after all, or is no longer the best fit, whatever it is that's up, getting real to recognizing, okay, this is an area where I don't necessarily need to know what's gonna die about it, but something has to move. 
as long as we're in the place of resistance to the release, we stay stuck. We could stay stuck for six months. We could stay stuck for 10 years. We could stay stuck for our whole lives. All the time wondering, why isn't it getting better? Because we have to recognize what it is that we need to let go of. And it's, this isn't a science of mind thing in particular. I mean, it's embraced by science of mind, but I mean, this truth goes all the way back to the mystery schools in ancient Greece and Egypt, where they had a ceremony of ceremoniously dying to their old selves because they knew they couldn't be reborn as a more spiritually evolved being until they let something about their previous self go. Last week we talked about you can't read the new chapter while you're still reading the old one. You can't turn the page while you're still reading the previous page. And so let's just go within for a moment and allow ourselves to recognize where the stuck is. Just let it rise up within yourself. Where is my stuckness? And am I ready to begin the process of getting comfortable with releasing something about this situation so that I can be unstuck? Mm, beautiful. And as we bring our awareness back into the room, it's perfectly reasonable if there is a part of you that feels nervous about this. If there is part of you that's like, it might be time for me to go to the bathroom right now. And it turns out I have to go to the bathroom for the next 23 minutes until this lady stops talking. It's so natural to be nervous about the idea of leaving something that we're comfortable with. It's even more scary to think about leaving something that has been pretty good for us. You know, where we can see good things have come from it. But sometimes we have to be willing to let go of the good for the great. C. Joy Bell C. wrote, We can't be afraid of change. You may feel very secure in the pond that you're in, but if you never venture out of it, you will never know that there is such a thing as an ocean, a sea. Holding on to something that is good now may be the very reason why you don't have something better. One of the ways we can soften into this idea of releasing is to get really conscious about what we are choosing to release. We become afraid when we think things are out of our control, but the truth is we get to decide what we're going to let go of and then what we're going to open up to on the other side of that release. Nothing's being taken from you. It's not called, um, I submit to Reverend Leslie stripping away my beloved thing that I love so much and she's a mean lady. <laughs> Jeff insists that's too many words for one slide. It's I release, I give it over. I'm willing to let go to open my arms up for the next good thing. So step one is softening into choosing what to release. For many years, I was a jeweler. And you don't really stop being a jeweler. I guess I'm still a jeweler. I still know how to make jewelry. I still sometimes make jewelry. But professionally, I was a jeweler for many years. And for 11 years, I worked with one particular company. And I was the creative director for a chain of bead and jewelry fabrication stores. And I loved my job. I was really good at my job, like weirdly good at it. Um, Perhaps there's something in your life that you've settled into that you were just surprisingly extra good at. It, was, it fit my personality and the way that I think. And, and I wrote a bunch of books, and I designed all these beautiful kits and classes, and I had partners I worked with that I adored, and I loved my job. And this voice, this voice, I kept 
talking to me. And it kept saying, you're going to be a minister. No, I'm a jeweler. I have a really good, I have like the dream job for a jeweler, right? I'm, I'm not going to go do that other thing. You're going to be a minister. You're going to quit that job and you're going to be a minister. The sock puppet and I do not always get along so very well because I really couldn't absorb the idea of leaving a job that was so much a part of my identity. I mean, I'd, I started working for this company when they were one little store and was a big part of building them up into this national chain. And, and you're telling me I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to go into a completely different direction to do a completely different job. And, oh, by the way, there's this weird gap in between where you're going to quit this job and then not get a ministerial job for like three years while you finish your ministerial degree and qualify for it. And then maybe someone will hire you maybe someday. You can imagine how well this went over on the inside of me. There were tantrums. There was crying. My husband's nodding in the front row. Yes. There was, you can't make me. And then one day it was just, I'm going to have to let this go. I'm going to have to let this go to make space for the next thing that just clearly wants to be born in me. There wasn't anything terribly wrong with my job, but it was between me and ministry and anything between me and ministry had to go. So this leads into my second point about being willing to soften into releasing, into letting a part of yourself die off. And that is, how do we let it go without making it wrong, without making it bad? There is this deep human tendency. I, I have to think it's hardwired into our brain that in order for us to be willing to let something go, and not feel like we're betraying it or abandoning it, we have to make it the bad guy. Whether it's the relationship, the job, the friendship, whatever. Whatever it is, in order to let it go, we need to make it the other. We need to burn that bridge. So we have a difficult time breaking up with the perfectly nice guy that just isn't quite exactly the right guy for me without needing to list all the reasons he was wrong. And he did this, and he went there, and he, and he never, ever did this other thing. And why did I never hear, and I just don't, I just be gone. What if we didn't have to do that? What if the flip side of I'm always a choice is even when it's a good thing that I'm letting go? What if we could stay in loving kindness around the thing we're releasing and not need to make it wrong or have it have hurt us in some way to be willing to know that there's something that's even better available for us. Ernest Holmes said, and you've heard us say this a lot and you'll hear us say it a lot more times because it's good. He said, show me someone that is for something and against nothing, and I will show you the next exalted being. We can be for our own highest and best, even if it carries us away from a friendship that served beautifully for 30 years and just doesn't fit anymore. Without us needing to make them wrong or make ourselves wrong for letting that natural evolution move us in a different direction. Can you feel that on the inside of yourself? When that push comes up to shove it away because it's uncomfortable to see the change. Can you connect on the inside of yourself to the idea that there are infinite wonderful beings and opportunities in this world and us choosing no thank you, or no thank you any longer, doesn't make that person, relationship, opportunity, experience any less wonderful. In fact, when we choose the no thank you, 
We're opening them up to the person who needs exactly what they're offering beautifully and perfectly. We're creating a bigger, better yes for the one that is to come. Can you feel that? So how do we do that? We do it by choosing to honor that which we release. We are so good as a culture at celebrating and having ritual around that which we are calling forth beautifully and joyfully into our lives. And we, as a culture, sort of collectively suck at celebrating endings. We just don't do it. What if we did? What if we did a ceremony around uncoupling? Even if the other person in the relationship isn't interested in participating, what if we did it for ourselves and honored all the good things that we're choosing to uncouple from now? What if we gave ourselves a beautiful little ritual at the completion of a job and honored all of the positive things that came from that experience? What if we let ourselves really appreciate the irritating boss who had lots of great qualities? What if we let ourselves appreciate how we grew in the challenging relationship? We are always at choice and we are most especially always at choice in how we perceive what's going on in our lives. And if we are going to choose to live the greater life, to take on what we've been calling the big change, whatever the big change is in your life, if we're going to choose to engage in that and to call in this bigger thing, then we can choose what we're letting go of to make space for it. We can choose how we're energetically releasing that. We can choose how we choose to honor and complete that process. There's a beautiful Dylan Thomas poem that I argue with all the time in my mind. And part of that is, do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. It's beautiful. And I argue with him in my head. What if we don't? What if we don't rage against the dying of the light? What if we recognize the dying of the light as a natural part of being alive and instead honor the light as it dims and then turn our attention to the next candle and the next flame that's coming up? What if we let ourselves be expressions of God's grace as this moves through us? What if we welcome the emotions that come? What if we sit on the sofa crying because that's where we're at and then take a nap because that's where we're at and then make a list of good qualities because that's where we're at and then tear it up because that's where we're at and make all of it fine. What if we just let all of it be good? We are at choice. And so this is the invitation. This is the invitation to create a hospice plan for whatever it is we're letting die. I mean, hospice is brilliant, isn't it? It's this wonderful process of making sure that as someone is transitioning out of this life into the next, that they have what they need, that they feel empowered to make the choices that make sense for them and feel uplifting for them. Are we empowered to make the choices we need around what we're letting go? Will we claim that empowerment? In hospice, we make sure that you are supported by people who understand and care and are there for you around this shift. In our process of this sacred hero's journey, you've built a community around you of people that you trust, people who can hear you, people who are ready to support you as you go through this transition. Have you called them up? 
Have you let them support you? It does us no good to have people who are willing to support us if we don't let them in. I say that with so much force and power in my voice because I am the most guilty of this, of anyone in this room. When I'm under stress or distress, I do this cocoony thing. And every once in a while, I get... You in there from Reverend Karen? Are you going to come out anytime soon? <laughs> do you want to tell me why you're in the cocoon? <laughs> It doesn't do me any good to have a powerful co-minister if I don't tell her what's going on. It doesn't do any good to have the husband who would support me through everything if I won't let him support me. Are you letting your people support you? Do they even know what's going on with you right now? Mm. And the third thing about hospice that I just love is that it offers us this opportunity to transition with grace with the energy of life that we have selected, held in this bubble of love and acceptance, whatever comes and whatever is, we can have that now. Yes, there are tentacles. There are. Science of mind doesn't tell us we won't be dealing with life unfolding. It will happen. It is happening. It will always happen but we can create a world in which we can transition in grace through whatever change comes. And doesn't that feel lovely? Daphne Rose Kingma said, holding on is believing there's only a past. Letting go is knowing there's a future. So this week, let us really delve in to what we're ready to let go of and make some conscious choices about how we're going to do that in a way that allows us to transition with grace in loving kindness for everyone and for ourselves. Are we in? Beautiful. And so it is. Mm, so please join me in prayer as we... Anchor that idea even deeper into our bodies, into our souls, into our hearts. Recognizing that we are surrounded and immersed in an energy of sweet spirit, of pure goodness, of absolute love and infinite potentiality. And that it is responding to our thoughts, to our intentions, to our emotions and echoing back to us an expanded version of that which we are calling into our life. So as we release anything that is no longer working, we're opening the door of our heart to invite in that which will evolve us to the next highest state of expression. And the infinitude of life itself is ushering that goodness in for each and every one of us without any efforting, without any forcing, without any need to hustle. We just open up and let it flow in, accepting the healing, accepting the abundance, accepting the wholeness, accepting the joy, the love, the peace, the grace, the ease, the depth, the truth, and recognizing that this is who we have always been, and this is who we will always be, that at the core of our being, we are divine truth unfolding powerfully and beautifully and uniquely in a way that only we can be and do and we are important and my evidence for that is that we are here that an infinite energy brought us forth each of us uniquely and perfectly for life right here right now for a time such as this and i trust that every part of that is perfect and powerful and good. As I release that word, that truth, that knowingness into the action of universal law, and call it good, we claim it together as we say, and so it is.